All right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. This is a really exciting opportunity today with us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants because we are having our second ever Cross International Epic uh, Environmental Exchange. I'm joining you live in Newfoundland in the early morning. We've got our speaker today joining us in the UK, and we've got students all across India. This is our second broadcast ever in conjunction with the amazing Jai Sharma uh, to highlight uh, some of the coolest environmentalist, conservationist, biologists around the globe with students all across India. It's so exciting to have you guys back today, and I can't wait to dive in with today's topic. Now, earlier this year, I hosted something called the Hope for Wildlife series. We had eight incredible scientists just join us from around the globe talking about their efforts to change the world for the better to help bring species and habitats back from the brink and i they, they were all great don't get me wrong I, the eight incredible programs but i did have one favorite one so i will introduce our speaker in just a minute and what our topic is today but first i wanted to bring in jai sharma he is one of the best environmental educators i've run across in my entire career in this field and so i'm so excited to welcome him into the broadcast to explain a little bit about what he's up to uh in india and beyond so jai welcome Welcome in before we dive in with Tim in a minute uh, and take us away. Tell us a little about yourself and the work that you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jesse, for the wonderful introduction. And yes, I'm always thankful and grateful to Jesse. He's a very close friend and exciting guy. And we have been connecting the globe together and bringing wonderful uh, people working in the field of conservation. So it's different fields, different ways, different uh, means. Like some are biologists, some are conservationists, some are researchers, some are educators like me. So I'm into nature and wildlife education where I'm more into jungle with uh, kids, families, corporates, making them understand the connection between the wild world, the nature, and why the different organisms are uh, required and interdependent and how do they function to help the ecosystem be healthy for us. So today in that exciting talk, I'm very excited to hear uh, Dr. Tim Lamont, who is working fantastic, uh, fantastically in the field of ocean and reefs, which is a very important uh, subject these days because of the ocean reefs getting damaged or destroyed because of the global warming or the uh, plastic pollution. So I think he is a better person to explain on that. And I welcome you all from all over the country. I know I don't know from how many cities, how many schools kids are there. So thanks, thanks Tim for joining us, and uh, it's up to you. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, really, really exciting to be joining you in um, in, in in Canada and and in India. Um, what what an exciting platform you've made, Jesse. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you want to dive in, I know you've got a lot to share with us today on coral reefs, on some of your incredible work, particularly around soundscapes that a lot of our students will be uh, joining and learning about for the very first time. So let's do this thing and, and dive in, man. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, so I, as Jesse said, um, this was this talk was originally as a, a, a part of a series called the Hope for Wildlife series. Uh, and that was a, a brilliant series. And um, I'd really encourage you to go and check out some of the other talks online as well. Um, but today we're going to be thinking a, a bit about coral reefs. Uh, so I'm a marine biologist. I specialize in studying coral reefs around the world. Uh, and I'd like to explain a little bit today about what they are, how they work, and why I think uh, we can still have hope for our coral reefs and why they're still worth fighting for. So let's start by uh, introducing each other. So, so why don't you jump in the chat and tell us where in India you're watching from? Um, Jesse can read some of the answers out as they come in. And, and while you're doing that, while you're finding the chat and getting to your keyboards, I'll explain a little bit about where I'm coming from uh, and my background. So as I said before, I'm a marine biologist. Uh, I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because I love doing my job. I think it's a, I, I can't believe I get to do this, this work as a job. It's a, a real privilege. Um, the best part of my job is being able to share the ocean uh, with some of the most amazing creatures on the planet uh, and being able to share space and, and share encounters with, uh, with animals like this in the top left is called a whale shark. It's the biggest fish in the sea. It's the size of a big bus swimming past you. Um, or this potato cod up in the top right, which got very friendly and came and checked me out. Um, I was on a boat just above this dolphin in the bottom right and, and then trying to hold my breath for as long as the turtle in the bottom left. Of course, I didn't do very well because turtles can hold their breath for about seven hours and I can hold my breath for about two minutes. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't a very hard fought competition, uh, but but it's an amazing job to do. Uh, and that job takes me to lots of different ecosystems as well. So on the left there, I'm diving in um, 
in underwater caves under the jungle in Mexico. Uh, and then that photo at the bottom is exploring a coral reef in Australia. Um, and then also I've been doing some work where it's really cold as well, up in the Arctic Ocean. So you can see those two photos on top are, are studying, um, listening out for whales below the sea ice uh, in the Arctic Ocean. So I've, I, I'm privileged to work in lots of different places around the world, but today I'd like to talk to you about coral reefs. Just, Jesse, are people coming in on the chat? Where are people coming from today? Jai, I, I, I think they might not have YouTube accounts to share in the chat because you need them to be able to share. Uh, but Jai, the students that you reached out to today, they're largely in Bangalore or across India generally? Uh, they are mostly from Bangalore and then across India also from YouTube. In YouTube, they'll be from all over the uh, country. But in the stream yard, they are specifically from Bangalore, but they are from uh, three, four different schools. Fantastic. Oh, that, you, you gave me a very tough come, uh, choice of uh, selecting only five or six kids for all these. <laughs> so they're fighting with me. <laughs> well, that, that's brilliant to hear. And, and wherever you're coming in from, uh, welcome. And, and I look forward to answering questions later. And, and hopefully we can all explore together uh, the, the joy and the fascination of what it is to, to study these coral reefs. Um, so I'll skip that one because because the chat's not working so well. But let's start by thinking first and most importantly about what is a coral. So I like to think of corals as uh, as three different things, really, um, but because, we, you, you know, you, you'll often start when, when you're thinking about what something is. Well, is it, is it a plant or is it an animal or is it something that's not alive? Is it an, a mineral? And in a sense, coral is all three of those things. Let me explain why, why I think it's all three of those. So, so at first, a coral is an animal, and it's an animal that is most closely related to a jellyfish. That's probably its, its closest living relative that you, you'll have heard of, except jellyfish uh, have their, their body on the top and then their stinging tentacles float below them. A coral is like a jellyfish that's been turned upside down. Okay, Its tentacles poke upwards up into the water above it, and it uses those tentacles like a jellyfish does to catch tiny little morsels of prey and, and catch things in the water that it, that it can then eat. But what it's got that a jellyfish doesn't have is it has aspects of it that are like a plant. And in fact, it has a tiny plant called a zooxanthellae that lives inside of the coral animal. OK, so that, that there it is there. Im imagine you've got this upside down jellyfish uh, that is able to it has this plant that lives inside it. And so as well as eating things that it catches, it's able to photosynthesize so it can use sunlight to make its own energy. So in that sense, it's like a plant living inside an animal. And then on top of that as well, it has the ability to make rock. OK, so, so through a, um, a reaction called calcification, um, the, the coral can take calcium ions out of the water and create a skeleton beneath it. So it's an animal a bit like a jellyfish that has a plant living inside it that it can photosynthesize, and it can make rock as well. And it makes this skeleton which it lives on. And together, you get loads of these coral animals all living side by side, creating the, you know, creating this same big rock skeleton that they live on. And we call that a coral colony when we have lots of them together. Uh, so this is a close up picture of a coral colony. So you can see each of those little things that look like flowers, each of those is one coral animal with its tentacles sticking up into the air. What you're seeing is the tentacles and they're living together and creating one coral colony. And then when we zoom out even further, many coral colonies make up a coral reef. Uh, and there's lots of these different types of corals. So they make colonies that are different shapes, different sizes, different colors. And that's why coral reefs are so spectacularly beautiful to look at uh, and to swim around. So that's the coral, that's the basis of the, the coral reef ecosystem. Uh, what I study is I study the fish that, um, that live in the coral reef ecosystem and the fish that swim around and make up part of that system. Uh, and in particular, I'm fascinated by the noises that these fish make. So most people don't think of fish as very noisy animals, but that's just because our ears don't work well underwater. When you listen with professional equipment, we call that a, a hydrophone, these specialized underwater microphones, we hear that actually these fish are really noisy and they make all sorts of bizarre noises. They're, they're really wonderful. Let, let me play you a couple of them. So this fish in the top left, this is called an Ambon damselfish, and it makes a sound like this. 
It sounds a bit like a bird, I think. Uh, and, then, and then there's a fish that sounds a little bit like a cat purring as well. So this fish in the top right is called a sergeant major. Listen to what they sound like. I think that sounds a bit like a cat purring. Uh, and then in the bottom left, there's this fish called a reef croaker. It makes this drumming sound. Uh, and in the bottom right, we have a clownfish, a, a fish called a nose stripe clownfish. And, and it bangs its teeth together and makes this sort of chattering sound. So there's lots of different, different weird and wonderful noises that these fish make. And together, all of these sounds create a really wonderful mixture of sounds, a bit like when you bring lots of instruments together to make an orchestra. You bring lots of fish together and it makes a big old mix of sounds and we call that a soundscape. So here's all those sounds played together. So loads of different weird and wonderful noises. Very, very loud, diverse, weird coral reef soundscape, all sorts of different different sounds. And, and for me, that's fascinating. And, and part of what it is to understand the coral reef is understanding where all these sounds come from and, and how they make up the ecosystem. Of course, coral reefs are threatened today as well, as Jai was saying at the start. Um, and there are some, some real, uh, really big threats that face coral reefs today. Uh, that cause a lot of damage on reefs. Uh, here are two of them. So on, on the left, we've, you can see a picture of the impact that a cyclone can have on a coral reef. Very, very high winds create these big storms at sea and they can batter a reef and really break everything up. And on the right, coral bleaching. This is when the water temperature gets too high uh, caused by global warming and the, the sea gets too hot and the, that relationship that I talked about between the plant and the animal in the coral, that breaks down. So the plant no longer lives inside the coral. That means it loses its color and it loses its ability to photosynthesize and then the coral will die. So these are, are big problems facing reefs uh, and, and they can cause a lot of damage to reefs. They, for that reason, it's important that we understand better how to protect our reefs and how to rebuild our reefs when they've been damaged. So when something like that happens, we, we can try and, and um, try and find ways to rebuild the ecosystem. And that's one of the things that I'm really excited to be working on at the moment is, is trying to understand how to rebuild damaged coral reefs. So here's some more pictures of coral reefs being damaged. It, it really is heartbreaking to see and, and is a, uh, it, it's important that we understand and get better at rebuilding these ecosystems. One of the places in the world that they're best at rebuilding coral reefs and where the most progress has been made uh, is Indonesia. And so on the left here, this is a, a researcher in Indonesia called Dr. Trias Razek. Uh, she's one of my colleagues and I'm, I'm really fortunate to work with her. She's a real expert on how to rebuild these, these, uh, these damaged coral reefs. And here's an example of a method that they use in Indonesia um, to, to rebuild these reefs. This is a, a project run by an organization called Mars Sustainable Solutions. And this, uh, this metal frame you can see that they've covered in sand that these two men are working on, this is called a reef star. And so these, these are frames that they make and you can see these guys are tying little bits of coral to this reef star. And then when they're covered in coral, you can see that there's an area of damaged coral reef there at the bottom. They then swim these reef stars down to the bottom um, to, to plant these new corals on these metal frames down where there's a damaged reef. And they plant lots of these reef stars all together in this, in this big area. So there's lots of tiny little fragments of coral. And then over several years, the coral will grow. And, and you know, after a while, you can barely even see the metal frames anymore. The coral grows really well uh, and the reef starts to recover. It's really amazing to see, and it's a really great example of a project that is able to bring back coral after, after damage has been done. So you can see on the left, this is what a, a, the reef looked like at first when it was very, very damaged. And then in the middle there, picture B, uh, that's where the, the reef stars have just been planted. And picture C, after several years, the coral starts to grow back uh, and the ecosystem starts to recover. It's a really encouraging story. So that's how to replant and regrow coral. But of course, 
there's uh, there's still something missing there, isn't there? There's no fish in any of these pictures. Uh, and so we we were challenged by this and, and, and we were started to think, well, how can we bring fish back? Once you've regrown the coral, how can you get fish to come back to a coral reef? And the the uh, so we did this experiment in Australia, and the uh, what we were trying out was using exactly the same noises that you heard before. So I'll play them to you again now. So all these weird and wonderful noises of fish. We thought, well, if, if we can play the right sounds, if we can play the noises of a healthy reef with lots of animals on it and lots of fish, that might persuade other fish that this is a good place to live and, and to come and join as well. Come and join the party. You can, you can hear how good it sounds. And so we did this experiment around this island in Australia where we, we, we set up lots of individual little tiny patches of coral habitat. And on some of them, we played the sound of a really healthy reef and on others, we didn't play a sound at all. And, and, and we tested the difference. We, we counted how many fish will come if we play a healthy reef sound compared to if we don't play any reef sound at all. And then here you can see some of the loudspeakers we were using. There's a, there's a picture of me setting up a loudspeaker. And here are the results on the left. So when we had no loudspeaker or a dummy loudspeaker, both the red and the orange boxes there, that's, that's when we didn't play any sound. We got about 25 fish on each habitat patch. But when we played those sounds, when we did what we call acoustic enrichment, we got twice as many fish coming back. So to us, this was a really encouraging finding uh, that by understanding a little bit more about how the coral reef works, in this case, by understanding about the sounds of a coral reef, we can then find new ways of protecting and restoring these habitats. So, by under, so in our case, by understanding more about the sounds of the reef, we were able to find a way of bringing fish back to newly recovered coral reefs. Uh, and, and that, for me, sums up why it's worth studying, uh, studying these underwater ecosystems, why it's important to, to understand and learn as much as we can about them, because ultimately, the better we understand these ecosystems, the more likely we are to do a good job of protecting them. So in summary, coral reefs are beautiful, colorful, diverse places uh, that are very important for nature and for people that rely on coral reefs as well. Uh, they're made of these superpower animals that are like an upside down jellyfish, which have a plant living inside them so they can photosynthesize and which make their own rocky skeletons below them. They are damaged by, by climate change and by cyclones and coral bleaching in particular. But there is lots of work and lots of progress being made, both in being able to regrow the coral after damage and also using loudspeakers to call the fish back in. Uh, so thank you again for having me. Um, that's, that's me explaining the work that I do. And, and I'd love to hear if any of you have any questions or comments or if any of you have seen a coral reef. Uh, it would be great to have a bit of a chat now. Tim, uh, spectacular as before. I honestly, it's one of my very favorite things I've ever learned in science. I've, I've been following biodiversity and conservation for like my entire life since I was four years old. And the idea of playing soundscapes on a reef to attract fish is so fascinating. I, I try to explain to people, it's like, if you went to an apartment and you're walking around the flats and, and there was no noise in many of the rooms and it was just like an empty hallway, would you want to move in? Probably not. But if it sounded like people were cooking and having fun and having coffee, you know, oh, good. Now I want to like, go live there even if... Uh, might be a little shoddy on the outside, but that's okay. We're going to come in. It's like a little community. It's very, oh, it must be so, like, you know, as a scientist, you do this and it's like, wow, great data, but it also must be just so fulfilling and exciting. It must, I, I, how does it feel to like get that data back and just be like, holy, I mean, it's, I don't know. The emotion. Yeah, it's, it's, it. it's lovely to be working on it. And it's a, it was a really, um, rewarding experiment to do because the way we did the experiment actually was we had lots of individual um little mini coral reefs that we'd made all around a bay and we were playing sound on some of them and we weren't playing sound on others and we were comparing the difference between them and and to compare the difference i didn't just go back to all the reefs once i was going and visiting all of these little reefs like you know every day for about six weeks and and i was making a note whenever a new fish moved in so I got to know these reefs very well. And, and so I could see the data coming in and I could see the experiment starting to work, you know, because 
we, it was a bit of a long shot and we thought, oh, will this work? Won't it work? And then as I visited each of these reefs, I was like, wow, you can really see it. When I, when I can hear all the sounds and, and when we're playing these sounds, we're getting twice as many fish arrive. It, it really was a, an amazing experiment to do. Well, and for our students' sake too, like nothing gets you twice the level. Like there's, I've never even heard of a result where it's like, oh, this is like as double as good as, it's like 5%, usually 10%, like that's solid if you could have that level of impact, but uh, twice is good. So because you didn't go into this with the idea that like you were, it was a hypothesis, you wanted to try it out, was it inspired by anything? Was there any land-based thing where you'd seen something like this happen before? I'm so curious. It, it was, yeah. We, we often joke that, um, uh, people who study biology on land, like in forests or in savannas or whatever, they're, they're often ahead of us underwater because it's easy to study biology on land because you just have to walk around. Whereas to study biology underwater, you have to hold your breath, you have to swim underwater, you have to get a boat. It's much harder to do. And, and so we, we often learn lessons from uh, the biologists on land who understand their systems much better. So actually for years already, people who work with birds have been understanding the sound that birds make and the importance of sound in the life of birds for, for much longer than we have with fish. And they do this exact same thing with birds, it turns out, and it works really well. So especially with seabirds, if they're, if they're trying to re-establish a colony of seabirds somewhere where there's no seabirds living there at the moment, one of the things that they'll do is they'll take loudspeakers and they'll play the sound of happy seabirds on the rocks and then other seabirds will think, oh, it must be good to live over there. There's lots of happy seabirds there and they'll go and live there. And, and then this colony will start. And so we saw that and we thought, well, it, birds and fish in some ways are, are not that dissimilar. They both make noise. They both, you know, go and live where other fish or other birds like to live. So why don't we play the noise of happy fish? And if it worked for the seabirds, maybe it'll work for the fish. And, and there you go. And, and so a lot of science is like that. You take inspiration from, uh, from a different study or a different system and, and you try it in your own study and system. And, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, but it's uh, worth trying, right? Like in, it's you, worth a go, like, yeah. And I, I love this and we're starting to see more and more of this. I mean, COP15 is an example of sort of global collaboration around biodiversity happening right now, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel or start from scratch with a lot of these cool ideas on bringing species back. If you're in England and you're trying to bring back a forest, you can see what people have done in Brazil and Australia in Guinea and, you know, take those solutions and put them into practice and sort of have the success much faster. So I, I'm so glad to see that that's the case in, in all enterprises of, of science. And also just in general, you, you started out with these, these beautiful fish sounds, which I mean, what I find so fascinating about this is that so many people in the origins of marine biology, oceanography, began with Jacques Cousteau and the silent world, this idea that there's this whole other world, but silent is such a prominent part of that. And instead, we're starting to learn and discover more and more how noisy it is and how important that is. And I think that's such an exciting sort of shift in the way of thinking about uh, seascapes and coral reefs and Oh, it's marvelous. Um, it is, it is. We, we're, we're just starting to learn that actually more and more about how, how noisy these underwater ecosystems actually are. At, at first, we thought they were quiet just because our ears don't work very well underwater. Yep. But, but when you listen with proper equipment, we find these amazing sounds. So, so actually, just next month, I've, um, I've, I have some colleagues who, who work in India or on coral reefs in India, and I've given them two underwater microphones and they'll be going to India next month and I'm recording for the first time the sounds of some of India's coral reefs. So we'll, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to share uh, what, what they find. Uh, I, I think so. I, I'm going to bring in Jai in a minute to ask some questions of his own on behalf of his class, but uh, Lockbury Ant's joining us on StreamYard wanted to know, do you have a favorite island for scuba diving? Now you had the chance to really get acquainted with these reefs, so it might be these ones. Around the world, is there anywhere that really jumps out for people that might want to get in the water themselves? Oh, I, I, I think one of the most exciting things is that so many of these reefs are so different. You know, I did, it, often people think, oh, well, if you've seen one coral reef, then you've seen them all. But, but that couldn't be further from the, from the truth. They're, they're so different in lots of different ways. So, so I've liked diving in different places for different reasons. So some, some of my favorite diving has been in Indonesia. Uh, because it's the, the center of what we call the coral triangle, which is the area of the world where there's the most diversity of coral and fish. And, and so there's, it's just like mind blowing how many different types of coral, how many different types of fish you can see in Indonesia. It, it's amazing. Uh, but, but then on the other hand, I've really enjoyed diving in places like Australia as well, because 
there they have a whole different set of animals and 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 it's those reefs that I've worked on for the longest and so I have, I've got to know them the best and then I also have a soft spot for some reefs in Kenya because they were the first ever coral reefs I dived on so it was like the first time I ever saw this ecosystem and so it's very difficult to say which is my favorite but I, I like different reefs for different reasons. This is a, a really niche question, but behind us, I have this coral reef image that we use for our broadcast for coral reef scientists. Can you look at the fish in this and the coral and tell us like what reef that is from that view or not? Is that like a, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what reef it is, but I could tell you what sort of type of reef it is. And that's because that that orange fish in, in the top in the middle is, is a fish called an anthias. And okay. that's a fish that specializes in living on reefs that are right on the edge of a very steep drop off close to where there's lots of nutrients and, and you know, what we call like an outer reef. You know, it, it's not going to be near the shore or in, in calm water or shallow water. Like yeah. this is a reef that's that's right, that's got a lot of nutrients and, and on the very edge of some very deep water. So I don't know if that narrows it down at all, but that's, that's the sort of thing. <laughs> it's a good start. On the movie note, I think, you know, when, when Nemo sets off uh, and he gets kidnapped and ends up at 40 P. Sherman, 42 all the way, uh, he's on one of those edges and it's just the endless water from there. And yeah. on the other movie note, I wanted to note, just because you mentioned two minutes breathing underwater, I watched Avatar the other day and Kate Winslet got to seven minutes free diving. So, I mean, she just did I, it a little bit as an actress. You can, you can do that. I, I saw that. It's amazing, isn't it? I'll, I'll obviously have to, uh, I'll, I'll have to up my game. Up I've, game I've, been, yeah. I've been being lazy and using my scuba tank too often. I'll have to try and get up to seven minutes. <laughs> uh, Joy, I'm going to bring in uh, our, our educator to share some questions of his own on behalf of some of the students watching him with him. Um, but Joy, welcome into the program. So, I mean, aren't you excited about this, the like Indian researchers getting the chance to listen in? I'm excited about this, this is I'm really, I'm really excited, and I wish I can touch the whale shark, or yeah. touch the uh, white reef shark, the left, uh, the black reef shark, the black tip shark, and a few octopuses I've held in Maldives and all. But I love to explore uh, underwater. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, uh, I was scared of water earlier. Yeah. I'm overcoming that. I can stand in front of a tiger or leopard or elephant for hours. <laughs> but it was fantastic. I really enjoyed your, and I think um, uh, surprisingly, yes, I learned a lot about uh, coral. I thought that they're just animals. I never thought that they're plants or uh, a combination of plants and uh, animals and all. So my questions will be with um, uh, view of the benefits children can gain from here. Like one is, of course, as a, a marine biologist, you are passionately into this. How did this passion start and how long you have been doing? So some series of questions I'll be asking on their behalf. So, yeah, yeah. Sure. It's, it's a good question. So I, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do when I was, um, when I was at school. I, I knew I liked biology. I was fascinated by all the sciences, but in particular, biology really fascinated me. So I thought I'll, I'll study biology and I'll, I'll go to university and I'll do a biology degree. But I still didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. And I tried a few different things. I tried working in a lab. That wasn't really for me. And I, I tried, you know, doing some stuff to do with the mathematics of biology. And that wasn't really for me. And then I I, I took a job one summer as a um, an assistant to a coral reef researcher. And I, I went and helped him out. You know, I cleaned his boat for him and carried his scuba tanks around the beach and, you know, did, did, did all the jobs to, to assist him. And, and I just loved it. I, I, I thought this is just fascinating. For me, it was that mixture of seeing how unique and beautiful and valuable these ecosystems were, but then also how damaged and how threatened they were. And I thought I, I want to spend my life understanding more about these places and trying to work out how we can protect them. Wonderful. So uh, how long it has been now since you have been uh, into this? It's been now about 10 years. I think yeah, uh, since, I since can then. See the, yeah, I can see the child in you and you're as excited as ever. Same with mm -hmm. all uh, those who follow passion. That's basically to motivate and inspire children because they are looking at very few career options these days and uh, they feel... So the second question in that will be like, uh, how technology is supporting? You have shown some examples of bioacoustics and uh, the hydrophones and all that. So because again, children looking at the being uh, engineers, they think that no... Science or biology or conservation is only for biologists. Uh, I keep telling them you can be an engineer and you can contribute to conservation through your uh, creativity, through your mechanics, through your uh, inventions. 
like we use in camera traps we use in uh, solar uh, uh, bore wells we use in drones we use the, the camera trap or the coloring of uh, animals and all so how do you feel that they can uh, learn or they can use different technologies to contribute into say coral coral uh, con- conservation ab- ab- absolutely it, in the the engineering side is hugely important for this as, as you've said lots lots of examples there from how technology helps your work with with gps tracking devices with camera traps and for us it's the same one of the most important things that happened for my work in the last 5 years was an engineer invented a way of having a very cheap underwater microphone and it changed our whole field it suddenly meant we could listen to reefs in so much more detail for so much longer in so many places because so many more scientists could now afford to do it because we had this affordable piece of good equipment that could work underwater so that was a really useful bit of equipment and then the other thing that's really useful for us that comes from an engineering is uh like software engineering and the ability of people to write computer code or write computer programs that can help do what we want to do so in our case things like analyzing sound um sound files we've got one project working at the moment where we're working with computer engineers who are using machine learning and deep learning algorithms to try and understand and unpick the language of these fish and and understand what all these soundscapes mean uh, and and that's uh, that's a really good example of something that as a biologist i have no idea how to do deep learning and you know computer artificial intelligence and all but when we work together with engineers and and computer scientists we can understand a lot better exactly perfectly i think i had a privilege of uh, seeing one of the programs on shark conservation and the use of machine learning and ai at hawaii that was by kelly kohler she is a nat, nat geo explorer and her team prashant mohesh you, you must be aware of him he is from mauritius and i think jesse has uh, been host to him oh yeah we know <laughs> prashant i met yeah. him in alabax he's a good guy yeah, so i was uh, fortunate to uh, see that program so i again saw that use of machine learning and ai into see the movements or as you said the analysis part of it so it's this this uh, linking or the connection which uh, children need to understand and follow their passion or some build something in future which will help help the biodiversity to sustain or rather recover from these losses yeah absolutely, ab- absolutely. the the um collaborations with engineers are very important and also with with social scientists and with people yeah. who work in communities of people as well is is really important so about half of my team here in lancaster the research group i'm in about half of us are biologists but the other half are, are people who are um are social scientists so that's our website lecreefs.org and uh yeah it, it's a mixture of people with different skills different backgrounds some people are good at biology some people are good at engineering some people are good at languages some people are good at social science lots of different skills go into conservation and and if i may briefly too like this is something that you know i hope some of our students are super excited about coral reefs and you want to go on to be coral reef researchers and learn more and i'll i'll share a bunch of resources to keep that going but this story is true of everything in science now if you want to be an astronaut a cave diver if you're interested in conservation in any field around the world it is so collaborative and one of the best parts about being a scientist is that you you go to school for this protracted period of time but at the end of that you get to work with people from all around the world on ventures that have real impact for making the world a better place and you get to partner with people that have completely different skill sets of your own like i mean it, it's such a uh, it's why i'm so vested and excited about science it's i mean tim you're the most passionate guy ever you're bringing up something too if you want to show us i can click that in um but uh it's it, i just i i love this note for everybody um two other quick notes jai i'll turn it back to you in a second we got some questions in our chat as well um if people are keen on soundscapes and tim i might have shared this with you before but sounds of your park is an incredible resource i really love this because it allows people to explore protected areas around the globe through the sounds that are in them and it's so fascinating to think about the world in that way uh and for our students we talked about you getting to explore using a scuba tank i always like to highlight the fact that by 8 years old at 8 you can start on the path to being a scuba diver so paddy bubble maker is the path to do that i mean it's very easy you'll start off at a pool but it's so magical to have that skill uh and it, it opens up so much of the world for you so i i hope our students take that opportunity in their in their lives let's see our 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 questions from our chat the rarest or the oldest fish you've ever found is there anything that particularly jumps out you're like wow that's the last one of that 
or yeah, I, so so I've never seen this fish before, but uh, I've, I've just put a link in the chat. Um, but but I would love to, and and it was an amazing piece of news I saw uh, earlier this year. Somebody saw a blanket octopus on the Great Barrier Reef, and that's a very very rare type of octopus that's almost never seen. But it's one of the most beautiful animals you'll ever see underwater. Oh. And so, so I hope one day to see a blanket octopus. I, I haven't seen one yet, uh, but they're, they're very rare and very beautiful fish. Oh, I've actually, I've never even heard of such a thing. So thank you for sharing that for me. I'm a <laughs> great new creature in my repertoire. Jai, um, time flies and you're having fun. We are nearing the end of the broadcast. Are there any last couple of questions you want to share to Tim before we go? A couple of uh, them I would like to know. Like one, uh, the major functions of these reefs and why should we protect? As we know that they do absorb carbon, and being plants, do they also provide oxygen? And uh, uh, means what are the other functions like, say, providing nurseries to fishes and all? Because people feel that coral reefs are just for beauty, just colorful uh, creatures, or whatever they feel like. So what's your thought on uh, that? Yeah, so, so I, th I think there are a, a, a few different um, services that coral reefs provide to people around the world that are really important. Um, so, so one that jumps out immediately is the value of coral reefs for providing food for, for coastal communities of people. Uh, so often uh, small scale fisheries are really dependent on coral reefs and, and the fish that live on coral reefs. Uh, and another example of the importance of coral reefs is their importance in protecting coastal communities from storms. Uh, and, and so many of the, the world's low-lying um, countries have a lot of settlements and a lot of people living on the, on the very edge of the coastline uh, in areas where storms can and do cause a lot of damage to, to houses and towns and cities. And if there's a coral reef that is living and thriving and functioning offshore, it will dissipate a lot of the energy that that storm will, will, will hit and it, and it will save a lot of damage when storms hit because the coral reef, like it blocks the impact of the waves before they reach the shore. Conversely, if the reef has been destroyed, those waves and those storms will sweep right in and cause a lot of damage to, to communities of people and, and houses and villages and towns on the coastline. So th those are two examples. Uh, fisheries benefits and protection of coastlines from storms uh, and there's lots of other other examples as well so you know often there'll be a big tourism industry around coral reefs so they provide ways for people to make a lot of money um, and and to you know make make a big industry um, locally uh, and and then also there, there's stuff about the the cultural and the heritage value of these reef systems for a lot of cultures around the world as well I wanted to just really quickly put up on screen uh, for students that might be interested, the Pristine Seas Initiative is one that I think really does a great job of storytelling when it comes to highlighting those diverse benefits of taking the time to protect a biodiverse area. This is a, their classic example. This is off the coast of Mexico, an area that was completely diminished, no fish. It was hurting the community. It was hurting the ecosystem. They left it for nature, and now fisheries all along the coast are thriving. There's a huge ecotourism industry. It's a spectacular example of recovery. If you give space for nature, nature will come back. It's one of the biggest lessons of the last you know, 50 years of, of conservation. Um, and so I, I'm so glad you, you highlighted a few of those. And some of them, like the, the storm thing, it's so difficult to quantify because you can say, oh, if there's no reef, the storm wipes out the town. Well, if there is a reef, the storm doesn't wipe out the town. So how do you say how much that's worth? And people don't really can't, you, you, it's hard to visualize, oh, this thing that didn't happen, this bad thing that was prevented. Um, but it, it's so crucially important that we think of, of nature in that way. Um, Jai, any last question before we wrap up? I'm going to make sure people have a lot of links to keep the learning going for Mars, for LAC Reefs. Um, but if you want to wrap us up with one final query, you're good to go. Yeah, as a, um, in a way, right now, what are the same uh, the temperatures or the global warming uh, contributing to the damage of coral reefs? We already know that the Australian Great Barrier Reef, I think 70%, uh, 80% is already destroyed because of the global warming. It's all... Uh, bleached bleached so what's your thought on that and what because i'm teaching climate change i'm doing carbon emissions i'm teaching carbon testing to children so i need to relate this that we do something wrong here affects the coral reef somewhere else something else happens wrong in amazon like we are losing every second one football field worth of forest that affects us the oxygen production and the carbon emissions so what's your thought on that yeah you're, you're right that like for many ecosystems around the world 
climate change is a huge problem for coral reefs. It, it really is. And the, the future of many of our reefs around the world hangs in the balance and, and will depend on whether we can sort out climate change or not, whether we can reduce our emissions fast enough to, to stop the, the global warming that's going on now. Um, but, but for me, I, I think it's important to, to have two, two things in mind as we work in this field. Firstly, that climate change is massively important and we have to reduce the emissions as fast as we can. But secondly, that we have to remember to focus as also on those corals that are going to survive and that are surviving. Because as you said, you know, in, in some areas like 70 or 80 percent of the uh, of the, the coral has died and, and the reef has been lost. But but we have to not focus too much on what we've lost. We have to remember that there is still 20 or 30 percent of the reef that is still alive and we can still protect that that bit of the reef. And we have to keep ourselves going bit because of that. So it's it, it's like when you it's like when you lose a goal in sport, right? Or you or you go behind in a game of something. You, you, you have a choice. You can either then think, oh, so we've gone behind. Now we're going to lose. It's all over. Or you can think, you know what? We've gone behind. We need to learn that lesson. Don't concede that goal again. And now go and score one of our own goals and, and, and now try and come back. And, and so it's a little bit like that. I think we have to, to learn from the warning, of course. Uh, and, and we have to try and stop this problem. But we also need to remember that the, the whole game isn't over yet. I love the sports analogy. Very World Cup of you as uh, Argentina takes the victory the other day. Maybe um, I've been watching too much football, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We all are. Um, Tim, as always, this has been a really extraordinary opportunity to learn from you. Thank you so, so much for joining us. I'll, I'll leave Jai to say a, a farewell of his own in a minute, but I wanted to just bring up a few things quickly for everyone. If people want to follow you on Twitter, check you out. Uh, you're on all manner of social media, and you can check out some amazing stuff that Tim and his team are up to there. LEC Reefs has some spectacular resources to keep the learning going. I'll make sure Jai has these in an email at the end as well. Uh, BuildingCoral.com, that's Mars Sustainable Solutions. Some really incredible work being done there. Uh, and I, I really do encourage people to check out uh, Pristine Seas is a great initiative to learn more about how we're protecting reefs, protecting ocean habitats to save life on this planet. And Jai's angle too, JaiNaturalist.com if you want to learn about his work to get kids out into nature. He's not afraid of facing off against tigers and leopards and now hopefully him and the students can go out to the reefs on the coast and uh, go face off against sharks and other cool things that are out there that also aren't worth fearing. Jai, um, I'll leave you to say a, a final farewell and I'll wrap up the broadcast from there, but thank you both so much gentlemen for making this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very exciting and very enlightening. The uh, knowledge and the I always love any kind of wildlife, especially oceans. Always that extra curiosity is there. If you permit me, one last question, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> how how much or how um, I mean, how much plastic have you seen, or at what depth, and how much it is damaging? Because I keep reading a lot of uh, data and uh, say um, uh, infographics of uh, report that. Plastic is going to overtake the number of fishes uh, by 2050, 2060. We'll have more plastic than fishes, and it's reached a depth of five kilometers, six kilometers. Is that true? And have you seen that? I, Especially I, turtles. You do see a lot of plastic underwater. It, it, it's true that those reports are. Um, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely true that that there is a lot of plastic in in a lot of the world's ecosystems, but in particular in the oceans. Uh, and and it's it's pervading some very remote places down to some very deep depths and even in some very remote seas the currents carry it everywhere and yeah so so i think it's it's important to remember that it, it's another example it's like our carbon emissions right it's easy to think that what we do here and what we do at, at our homes couldn't possibly have an impact on these far reaching ecosystems like this coral reef behind me but but they do actually and and that's why it's so important for all of us in our homes, in our schools, in our communities, with our families, to, to be thinking about the impacts that our actions have, not just where we are, but actually on ecosystems around the world. Yeah. That's a, it's such a spectacular message, and I want to tie it back to some Indian classrooms that might be tuning in as well. Um, again, ironically enough, National Geographic, Planet or Plastic, their initiative around this is the best I've ever seen, some spectacular storytelling there. And specifically as it pertains to our Indian students today, the Sea to Source Gandhi's expedition was a, a, just an incredible journey featuring, uh, I think, an entire team of all female scientists that did, again, from the source all the way to the ocean uh, and, and tracing plastic, how it comes from communities, how it ends up in the ocean, the impact of it there. Uh, it's the best story we've ever had. And on Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants' YouTube channel, there's actually several stories we've done with the members of that expedition so 
there's so much to take this forward. I, I, we're, we're time to end the broadcast. I know we could talk all day, but I do encourage you to check out Tim's uh, work online. There's so much more to learn. Um, and thank you so much to both of you for joining today. Jai. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's been well, really pleasure. wonderful uh, meeting you, Jai, and, and chatting and sharing our work. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you.